Good morning. I want to uh, give you greetings from Dr. Brewster. He is preaching at uh, Boston Avenue United Methodist Church in Oklahoma and has been invited to a preaching event this whole week. So he'll be up there for the next couple of days doing that. And I know that they are welcoming him, but he is missing you and sends his greetings. Well, today is the first Sunday in the season of Lent. And as you have noticed, we've chosen the prayer of St. Francis, the prayer that we read earlier. It will be our guide through this six week journey leading up to Easter. Now, last Wednesday was Ash Wednesday and I talked a little bit about this prayer as a whole the prayer that describes us as instruments. And I was reminded of two very special, rare, and priceless instruments. One was a Stradivarius violin that I was within arm's reach of being able to touch. It was last Easter when the orchestra was up here, and I could have reached out and touched it. I didn't. It is a rare and priceless, finely, finely crafted instrument Well, the other instrument that I was reminded of when I read this prayer was one that was described to me by a member of this church who is a heart surgeon. This is several years ago, but he talked about a clamping instrument that he uses in heart surgery, how very carefully it was crafted and calibrated to allow him to do his surgeries. And reading this prayer, thinking about instruments and tools, I began to think that these priceless beautiful instruments, what if we were to pick up that Stradivarius and use it to smash a brick wall? Well, it would be a waste of something precious and rare, wouldn't it? Or what if we used that heart surgeon's clamping instrument to hold together a stack of old newspapers so we could throw them in the garbage heap? That too would be a waste of something very precious and rare. The thing is that if an instrument is not being used for the very purposes it was created to serve, then it is a waste of something precious, priceless, and very rare. You and I are instruments of God, finely crafted and very, very beloved. We are created in the image of God and and God asks of us to be instruments used for the purposes of God's peace. And if we are not about the business of what we were created to be, then perhaps we too are a waste of something irreplaceable, precious, and beloved in the eyes of God. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God. And Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Amen. Two weeks ago was Minister's Week at TCU, and that's where my husband and I both went to seminary. And so it gave us a chance to connect with some of our old friends, and one in particular, a very dear friend of ours named Kim, She is now employed as a mentor to young ministerial students who are going into specialized ministries of social justice. And as part of that training, she takes a group of students every year to South Africa. Well, this past year, she was telling us over lunch that she had the good fortune of being able to meet face to face Bishop Desmond Tutu. They were staying at a retreat center just north of Johannesburg, and she had five students with her. One of the students was a young woman who, for circumstances beyond which she had any control, she was forced to take her five-year-old daughter with her on this trip. Now, this little girl was an especially gregarious child, and her mother was very worried about taking her to meet Bishop Tutu, one of her idols. And so Kim said that on the whole trip up there, she was just going over and over and over with her daughter. Now, what do you say to Bishop Tutu? You introduce yourself. My name is Rachel. You can tell him one thing about you, one, and then we have to go, okay? Okay, she said, but not with a lot of conviction. 
Well, when they arrived, Kim said she stood back to observe the people that were lined up to meet Desmond Tutu, this man who had been awarded three major international prizes in peace, among them the Nobel Prize. This man who had risked his own life time and time again to speak out for the poor and the oppressed of this world. This man who had made speeches to presidents and kings and was revered by millions, and they stood in his presence. She said she was overwhelmed. And then she watched with some concern as Rachel got closer to meeting Bishop Tutu. She did not look appropriately intimidated. <laughs> they got to the bishop. He smiled and shook the mother's hand and she introduced herself and then she introduced her daughter, Rachel. And then Kim said the bishop, not a young man, got down on his knees in the dirt smiled a broad smile and shook the little girl's hand. It's nice to meet you, Rachel, he said. My mom said I could tell you one thing about myself and then we have to go. And what I wanna tell you is I lost six teeth this year. <laughs> Bishop Tutu said, really? May I see? And they counted the teeth that were missing in Rachel's mouth. That is marvelous, he said. And the two of them spent several minutes just chatting together. And then when he stood to move on to the next person in line, he looked down at Rachel and said, you are a very bright and wonderful girl. You will be a blessing. Kim said it brought tears to her eyes. This man didn't just talk peace. He didn't just write eloquent speeches and reserve himself for kings and presidents. He practiced peace in his everyday life. He took his precious time to give the gift of paying attention, a small gesture of love to a little girl. Don't you wonder what that child will do with that experience someday when the full force of it hits her? What a tremendous blessing. Being an instrument of God's peace, sowing seeds of love doesn't mean we have to do big and grand things. Sometimes it's just as simple as offering the gift of acknowledging another person's presence with a moment of our time. Now, this is apropos of nothing, but I really have to tell you the end of Kim's story. She said she was so taken in by the genuine love that exuded from this world famous man of peace that when she and the leadership team gathered around him to have their picture made, she had her, she was right next to him. She put her arm around the bishop's rather large waist. And this is what she said. It was such a wonderful moment. And Bishop Tutu just exuded so much love that I suddenly realized I was patting the chubby little waist of Desmond Tutu. I don't know what possessed me. I was mortified when I realized what I was doing, but he just radiated so much love. I just wanted to pat him. <laughs> Desmond Tutu has been an instrument of love and peace and his life has changed the world. He has chosen to use one of his rare and priceless gifts, his own life, to be dedicated to the ways of peace. In a society that surrounded him with hate, evil and oppressive hate, he chose to offer love. And you and I are asked to do the same thing. Wherever there is hatred, let us sow love. Now, if we were just asked to be loving, we could manage to carve out some areas of our life where that might be very easy, like holding that small baby this morning, Patrick Rubin. That was an easy thing for me to love doing. Loving our family and close friends. Most of the time, that's easy. But what about people who annoy us? What about mean people who have hurt us? And what about people who actually cause us to fear for our lives? How in the world are we to love in the face of ISIS, for example? Well, it's one thing to sow love where it's cozy and warm and feelings are already there. It's quite another to sow love when there is every reason to hate. The truth is, 
We really aren't asked to solve the problem of hatred. We aren't asked to fix hate, to stop it. We are simply asked one thing, to love. Wherever we see it, wherever we experience it, whenever we feel hatred, even in ourselves, love. Martin Luther King did it. Gandhi did it. Desmond Tutu did it. Jesus did it. You and I can do it. But let's be clear. Love is not just a feeling. Love must be a choice. And sometimes that choice is very, very difficult. We must take the position to choose love over hate. Most hate is based in fear. And you know what one of the most commonly used phrases in the Bible is? I think this is very helpful when we're asked to love. Fear not. Because fear freezes us from acting in loving ways. And so we must face fear and choose love. Now, I've told this story before, but I thought it was worth repeating about the woman whose son was murdered and she sat in juvenile court every day of his killer's trial. At his sentencing, she was asked to speak and she looked that young man in the eye and she said these words, I'm going to kill you. Well, he was put into prison and for all the years that he was there, she visited this young man every week, bringing him homemade brownies and talking with him and taking the time to encourage him in his life. Finally, he asked her why she was doing this. Do you remember what I said to you at your trial? She said, yes. You said you were gonna kill me. Well, I did, she said. That angry boy that killed my son is dead. You are not that boy anymore. And she actually took this boy into her own home and raised him as if he were her own son. She took hate and turned it to love. I doubt that she felt warm and cozy feelings for this boy in the beginning, but she had the courage of her faith in God to allow her to be brave enough to love even in the face of deserved hatred. Sowing love does not have to be large or grand in their gestures, but for her, it was just taking brownies to a prisoner once a week, and it transformed both of them. We aren't asked to fix hatred, solve the problem of hatred, weed it out of existence. We are asked to sow seeds of love, and that sometimes begins with simply not buying into, justifying, and fueling and feeding the hate that we feel even if it's deserved. An old Cherokee brave once told his grandson that all people have a battle that goes on inside of them. The battle, he said, is between two wolves inside of each of us. One wolf is hatred and the other wolf is love. And the young boy looked at his grandfather and says, but which one wins? And you know what the grandfather said, the one you feed. It's true, isn't it? We cannot simply, or simply cannot allow ourselves anything that fuels our hatred. And that includes our conversations with each other, even the news media that we watch, because many of those things are simply aimed at the most primitive kind of thinking our brains possess. We call it the reptilian brain. You know that part of your brain which is stimulated by fear and responds quickly and with a fierce sense of self-protection, not noticing anything that gets in its way and never looking at the long-term results. That is a primitive response and it has cause tremendous suffering in this world. It is the easiest to feed and its hunger is insatiable. Don't buy it. Do you know that when Desmond Tutu was 13 years old, his father was a teacher in an all-black school and his mother cleaned houses for white families or the rich white families in Johannesburg. He and his family lived in the slums of Sophia Town outside, and apartheid was just accepted as the way the world ran. He'd never seen anything else. He'd never experienced anything else. Then one day, said Tutu, I was standing in the street with my mother when a white man in priest clothing walked by. As he passed us, he took off his hat to my mother. I couldn't believe my eyes. A white man 
who greeted a black working class woman. It was stunning. The stunning witness to honor the humanity and dignity and worth of this lowly woman so jolted him that he said he saw his life through a completely different lens and chose a path that would forever change his life and the world. He chose a path of sowing seeds of love where there was hatred. This man who went on to be influential in healing the wounds of war and poverty, this man who went on to healing the wounds of our world and becoming a great peacemaker, went on to be instrumental in tearing down the hateful, unyielding, evil walls of apartheid, it started with a tip of the hat. Just a small gesture of love, tore down apartheid. When Jesus, facing what he knew would be a very painful and terrible death, gathered with his friends on his last night with them, he did not gather them as an army to fight his enemies. He did not lash out in hatred to Judas, who he knew was going to betray him. He did not hate Peter, who would deny him, nor did he hold on to the bitterness and resentment that he could have felt toward those who said they would follow him but deserted him. Instead, he offered them his body in the form of bread and his lifeblood in the form of a cup, and he asked them to remember what he had come to show them, love that their lives were a precious gift of love and to love one another was the commandment he left. It was just a small gesture, but it has rippled throughout the world in the name of love and peace for 2,000 years, making us and calling us to take into our own being the body and the blood of Christ that we might be instruments of peace where there is hatred that we would so love. In the name of Christ, amen.